In the realm of dreams, where realism bends and the impossible becomes possible, there lies a story. A story that transcends the boundaries of the mind. A story that challenges the very fabric of reality. Welcome to the Actuality Podcast. Our journey begins with Jacob Olson, an ordinary college student with an extraordinary ability. An ability that allows him to control his dreams, to shape them, to live them. But our story is about more than lucid dreaming. As Jacob navigates the trials and tribulations of college life, Jacob's ability with lucid dreams opens up an adventure that changes his life forever. An adventure that blurs the lines between what feels like dreams and the real world. Between the seemingly impossible and real life. I'm your host, inviting you to join us on this incredible journey. So sit back, relax, and let your mind wander as we delve into the world of actuality. The sky outside was an inviting answer, decorated with thick white clouds. Aboard the plane, the stewardess, a fiery redhead, caught the eyes of the passengers as she passed by, pushing her cart filled with snacks and drinks. Her black uniform contrasted beautifully with the light blue and gray seats of the plane. She was the friendly type, chatting with the passengers while handing out complimentary flight nuts and crackers. It was one of those rare occasions that no one had request beyond the norm. She accepted it just fine, though, as it meant less to be concerned with. Excuse me, may I have a glass of red wine, please? An older lady asked. The stewardess welcomed the woman's request with warm eyes and a bright smile. Yes, of course. She poured the fine red liquid into a plastic cup and handed it to the woman. Faint words of thanks were submerged in the murmurs of other passengers as she moved forward to cater to other patrons. Of course, right as she thought how few other requests there were so far that trip, many more requests for food, drinks, and blankets were made, most by rude, uptight people who thought themselves above her. She took the request with good graces and responded politely, even if they hadn't asked in a similar manner. After concluding that round of delivering snacks to everyone who wished for them, she strolled to the front of the plane. Opportunities to relax in flight were sporadic, and though there were never any true rest periods, the quiet cabin allowed for pause at the moment. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, the pilot sat in his chair, one hand resting on the control board, the other extracting cookies and delivering them to his mouth. Think she can hold the fort for a while? Yeah, sure, no problem. Something the matter? You don't look so good. My head is killing me. <laughs> yeah. Too much overtime if you ask me. But there, I'm not feeling too great myself. Go ahead and knock out. Once you're up and going again, I'll take a snooze. I like the sound of that. He leaned forward and scanned the rows of buttons on the instrument panel, flicking the switch that set the plane on autopilot. Before reclining, he turned to the side and reached behind him. His large hand pulled back a panel door. A cubby of sorts. What began as a quick sifting of the contents in the small hole soon became an animated pulling of jackets, containers, and other equipment. As soon as he'd emptied the space, he began stuffing the items back into their original location and turned forward. An airy sigh indicated frustration over his failed search. Without a word, the co-pilot studied the pilot's face. Now, multiple shades of red. The pilot returned his head to his rolled sweater and tapped his fingers against his leg before moving to get comfortable. He fell asleep within a few minutes of settling into the right position. The co-pilot eyed his partner again curiously. The redness of his face was more noticeable than looked abnormal. It didn't seem to be a concern to the pilot, though, as he drifted off to sleep. The co-pilot gave his own chest a good scratching and nestled into his chair. With the cockpit quiet, he focused on the sky ahead. Soon he fell asleep too. A violent bout of shaking took the plane. The stewardess passed through the aisle doing her very best to contain her emotions. The plane flew at a mild slant now. She pressed her hand into the seat in front of her to support herself and wait for it to level. It took a while before the plane calmed to a rattle as opposed to shaking, but the tilt remained. It struck her as odd that the pilot had yet to activate the fastened seat belt signs. Paying no attention to the faint calls for service and inquiries of what might be happening, she hurried forward. Her arm extended, reaching for a firm grip on the handle of the door separating the passenger cabin from that meant for the pilots. She knocked discreetly and waited. 
Her hope was to get a response sooner than later, but instead she got silence. She knocked again, almost falling over as the plane achieved something best described as a mini-earthquake. Her knock was harder this time, but again, she got no answer. We have an issue, she said in a low voice, trying not to sound flustered. The secondary goal was to avoid broadcasting details where a passenger might overhear her words and begin to panic. There was still no response. Ominously, the plane's radio buzzed from the other side of the door. Uh, flight 757, just checking in. Do you read me? It sounded like a routine check-in, but neither pilot answered. The stewardess wondered for a moment if anyone was inside. Flight 757, this is air traffic control. Please respond. We have detected an abnormality in your flight pattern. The plane shook again, more violently this time. On the other side of the door, the pilot's eyes were half open. He blinked, double vision blurring everything he saw. Slumped over, he let out a hoarse cough and jerked forward, hitting his head on the plane's <laughs> control panel. The co-pilot remained unconscious. A patchy red rash climbed up the skin hidden by his shirt and became visible on the lower part of his neck. The pilot's head rolled across the panel, pressing every button it touched. A lurch popped up on the airplane screens, soon accompanied by error messages and warning flashes as more things went wrong. Another violent shake took over the plane. Not as strong as the earlier ones, but lasting longer than all of them combined. The stewardess rested her palm on her pounding chest in confusion. Oh dear. She backed away from the pilot's door, standing in the aisle between the cockpit and the first-class rows. There were more than a few passengers expressing their concerns, but her mind was miles away. Her own panic had begun to consume her. She broke free of the paralysis and glanced around the cabin. Simple concerns of the passengers began visibly swelling into panicked movements. Another shake of the plane brought a loud alert that screamed through the cabin, preceding the oxygen masks dropping from above the passengers' seats. The cabin lights went out, leaving nothing but the worried shadows of the people around her and the eerie red lights that flashed throughout the plane. The window nearest her framed a fearsome portrait of the vast ocean she knew to be beneath her. It replaced what moments before had been the vibrant blue canvas of a cloudy sky. Do you read me? Flight 757, please respond. The air traffic controller's frantic voice echoed from the radio. Are you there? Flight 757. Television shows worldwide abruptly switched from light-hearted morning shows to sudden news. The bio group Tangier is now claiming responsibility for the crash of Flight 757 today. The plane holding 555 passengers and destined for Paris is reported to have crashed in the Atlantic Ocean just several miles off the coast. The reporter presented. No other information has been released, and the crash is still under investigation. The room smelled new and resembled an apartment more than a college dorm. Rumors about freshman housing made finally seeing the place a relief. A fridge, sofa, and love seat filled the front room. He explored his new home away from home further. The bedroom definitely suited him, except for the girly sheets and blankets covering the bed. Looking at the sheets, a frown formed on his face. Bills would have to go. A toss and his suitcase and other bags landed on the floor near the bed. This couldn't be freshman housing, he thought, sitting on the edge of the bed to rest his tired legs. He flopped back against the bed and bounced on the slight spring in the mattress, making his hair wave in front of him. He scratched around on his head and made a mental note to get a haircut as soon as possible. Rolling onto his side, he reached for his backpack, hoisting it from the floor and onto the bed. The eggshell-colored folder he pulled from the bag contained a variety of documents, ones he'd need to find his way around campus and other random pages. He flipped through the papers, skipping over his long list of class schedules. One page that had nothing to do with the university held his attention. The still crisp document bore his name as the first place winner for a high school research paper he wrote. As an only child, he spent much of his childhood dreaming. Around age 11 or 12, he stumbled upon his own uncanny ability to take control of his dreams. He mastered manipulating the scenes in his mind, and every night he conjured a new adventure. In time, his dreams became an object of extreme interest to him. The paper he wrote spoke of lucid dreaming in vivid detail, with no bibliography of books or research from established scientists. A smile formed while he visualized himself receiving the award. The feeling of pride he felt that day came back to him. Beside the first place certificate, he received a $100 gift card to an online bookstore, which he promptly gave away. Reading didn't rank as high on his list of recreational activities as video games and other non-essentials, 
so a bookstore gift card had little value. The prize didn't matter to him anyway. He found a passion, and basked in the fact that the judges noticed him for it. It never crossed his mind that dreaming would land him a college scholarship. He reclined on the bed and pressed his head against the pillows, holding the certificate above him. Eventually, he lay there staring at the ceiling. His eyes got heavy, and his arms lowered to his side. A rhythmic beat pulsed around the dark nothingness, and then he heard her voice. The constant thudding soon became second place, a backdrop to the woman's melodic tone. The voice was unfamiliar, yet soothing, warm. It was a scene that had played out in his mind many times over the years. The dream would come randomly and infrequently. He listened as she sang, not sure of what she was saying or even if her words were for him. The melody carried him, and he drifted off into a state of absolute peace, letting her unknown words guide him. The soft vibrations of his pocket stirred him from his slumber. Jacob lifted his head from the pillow, his blurry eyes scanning the wall in front of him in confusion. He couldn't remember falling asleep, but it wasn't until he felt the familiar tickle of his phone against his thigh that he realized he had drifted off. <sighs> Hello? Hi, Jacob. This is Professor Melbourne. You have made it to the university, I trust. Yeah, I arrived a few hours ago. What's going on? Splendid. Well, tonight's class starts shortly, and I'm hoping you'll join us for an introduction. This would be an excellent time to experience the class. I thought classes didn't start until Monday. Formally, yes. However, we've been working for some time already. Our class is more of a research group. So we began prior to the start of the semester. Yeah, I... I guess I can get there. Perfect. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Jacob sat up in bed and reached for the folder he had left on the edge of the mattress before dozing off. With a stretch and a yawn, he swung his legs over the side of the bed and stood up. Feeling slightly disoriented, he grabbed his sweater and rifled through the papers on the folder until he found the one listing his classes. His heart sank as he realized oh, no. that his special relativity class was scheduled to start at 11 p.m. 11 p.m.? Who has class at 11 p.m.? As he rushed out of his dorm, he couldn't help but feel like this was some kind of twisted joke. With no idea where he was going, he knew he was going to be late. Jacob pulled out the crinkled map he'd stuffed in his pocket to find his way to the science buildings on the far side of the campus. A grunt followed a rotation of the map in his hands. It was a little annoying that... Unlike the rest of his classes, this one wasn't marked off on the map. His head bobbed up and down, taking turns matching his current location to the landmarks on the map as he walked. This is insane, he mumbled as the science buildings came into view off to the left. There could only be so much going on at this hour, he figured as he entered the main building. Everything was dark. He wandered the halls and happened upon a sliver of light shining through a crack in the door ahead. That had to be it, he thought as he approached the light and pushed the doors open. Jacob recognized the slender older man standing in the glow of the bright classroom lights to be Professor Milburn. He wore a short haircut, and the mixture of gray and white created a distinguished appearance. The professor turned to Jacob as he came through the doors, and the blank expression on his face became a smile. Jacob, how are you? Any trouble finding us? No, not really, but why is the class so late? Well... Our project is much easier to work on at night. Anyway, come on in. We haven't started yet. He rested his hand on the side of the door and beckoned to Jacob, who sheepishly made his way into the classroom. Rows of computers covered the wall closest to the door. The walls were all white and the floor was a dull gray. But even so, the room felt more welcoming than expected. In the back corner of the room, a large machine took up a big portion of the area. The body of the machine was a huge chair, one that looked comfortable. It sat on a large platform several feet from a wall where two large flat-screen televisions were displayed. Beside the chair, a bundle of wires extended from a computer connecting to the rear of the chair. To Jacob it all looked like some sweet gaming setup. A silly thought, but he got that way late at night. Once he managed to peel his eyes away from the strange machine... He noticed that several other students were already inside the classroom. Professor Milburn closed the door behind them, 
and Jacob's attention was drawn back to him. He moved and stood next to Jacob with his arms crossed. Tonight, we'll look closer at the process and manipulation of memory projection. I'm sure this is right up your alley. I guess. Come on. No need to be shy. Find a partner. You'll fit right in. Professor Melbourne nudged Jacob forward and walked with him to the table where two of the other students sat. Dean, Zoe, meet Jacob, our newest student. Hey, man. How's it going? Dean said. He had a head full of dark, messy hair and thick eyebrows. He lifted his hand up to high five, and Jacob awkwardly slapped hands with him. We were just working on writing up a report on black holes. Probably the most boring but necessary part of the process, Zoe explained. Her voice melted in his ears and caught him off guard. She had long, cherry blonde hair that was tied into a ponytail, with strands that fell over the sides of her face. Sounds great, you two. Want to give Mr. Alson here a rundown on everything? Sure, no problem. Great. Don't have too much fun. I'll be back in a bit for today's experiment. Experiment? What experiment? You'll see in a bit. So, how does this stuff work? Sorry, just wanted to finish writing up some notes here. It's all pretty simple. Well, at least it has been since making a few discoveries. Here's the simplest way I can explain it. For the longest time, black holes have been believed to be a gateway to time travel. The problem is that they open and close faster than humanly possible to reach them. For years, science theorized that if the human body could be teleported, you know, like Star Trek, that the problem would be solved. Basically, that's impossible. Teleporting the human body anywhere, that is. There's too much matter to move, and it would take ridiculous amounts of energy. But I've got to say, Professor Melbourne is pretty smart. With his research, we figured out a way to teleport without having to transport the body at all. Using a method called whole brain emulation, we've been able to transfer the contents of the brain rather than the whole person. So what ends up happening is the body being here in the lab and their brain wherever their mind takes them. To be more exact, uh, whole brain emulation tacks into the brain's temporal lobe, the part of the brain that processes memories and emotions and such. It views the activity within the lobe and projects it through a lens in the form of a light wave. We've found that the brain is most receptive to the process during REM sleep, the point at which a person can experience dreams. The light has no problems whatsoever with traveling at high speeds, so you're completely dodging the problem that you have with the impracticality of teleporting a human body. Wow. I didn't even realize research like this existed. If that got you going... Just wait until later. There's some really heavy stuff in this course, and you've really got to understand it to do well. But I guess that's just like anything else. If you don't mind me asking, what are you majoring in, Jacob? I, uh, don't actually have a major. I'm kind of taking some time to find out what I like. What are you two majoring in? We're both majoring in horology, the study of time, Zoe said, a big grin spreading across her face. Jacob had never heard of horology before. His first thought was that it didn't seem like something that would interest him. The look Zoe gave him when she answered, though, told him that it was something she really loved. He wondered what about it kept her so interested in the subject, and filed the thought away, intending to ask her about it later. All right, everyone, let's get ready for the night's projection experiment, Professor Melbourne announced. Zoe jumped up from her seat with excitement quickly organizing her papers into a neat stack as Dean had already done. Professor Melbourne made his way across the room to the machine that earlier captured Jacob's curiosities. He eyed Zoe, Dean, and the rest of the class as they walked over, joining them a moment later. With everyone gathered around the machine, the last student made her way to the group. Martha, would you mind? Sure. She slid off her white lab coat and placed it onto the computer table beside the machine then stepped onto the black platform and sat in the large chair. Attached to the chair's headrest was a large helmet of some sort. It had a futuristic look, made of a strange reflective and tinted plastic. After Martha adjusted the headband that dangled from the helmet, she reached beneath the armrest of the chair and the helmet lowered over her face. Jacob assumed she couldn't see anything, since the helmet covered everything above the tip of her nose. All set? Ready. The back of the chair hummed and lowered so that Martha lay at an angle rather than sitting upright. 
Jacob still wasn't exactly sure what was happening, though he assumed it had something to do with the memory projection and whole brain emulation he had heard so much about earlier. Martha lay still in the chair. Jacob folded his arms, thinking back on Zoe's comment about REM sleep making the brain more receptive to the process, and wondered if that was the purpose of the reclined position. Melbourne flickered off the brightest lights in the classroom, leaving only the few dim ones that pointed along the walls of the room. More clicking came from the keyboard. The click stopped as one of the two large screens on the wall above the machine flickered to life. We will be examining Martha's temporal lobe projections. The electrodes lining the helmet will not only intercept her brain activity, but will also induce REM sleep. Once she reaches prime levels, we will record what happens and watch it on the screens above. Until then, we just remain quiet and wait. To Jacob, it felt like they were waiting for a long time. He grew tired, but the late hour and not the five-minute wait brought on the yawns he fought hard to contain. Everyone's eyes shifted in unison as the screens began showing signs of motion. A dull light grew from the center of the screen. Dark hues of blue appeared and weaved into lighter shades, forming shapes within. Lines carved a path through the colors soon revealing an outline, then the full figure of a person. It was clear that it was Martha on the screen lying in the electric blue ocean. Soon the colors began fading from around her body. The definition of the clothes she wore and the details of the scene became clear. Her skin paled, and the ground around her turned green, to resemble the thickness of the grass. Each blade slowly sharpened into distinct elements. Sections of the blue still remained around her, just hovering above the grass in the rows and lines. It wasn't long until those stretches of blues began to disappear too, and they revealed beds of beautiful roses. Martha made the first movement of the projection, the simple action of lifting her head from the grass and tilting it toward the rows of roses beside her. She stared at them for a moment before moving again, repositioning herself onto her knees in front of them. Martha stared at the roses with a blank stare. She reached out to pick one of them, a bright orange one. She gripped the base of the stem, dirt rising from the flower bed as she claimed the rose for herself. Oddly, the scene changed. The bright orange rose was still in Martha's hand, but now she was no longer in the garden with all of the others. Now, she stood atop a city skyscraper with a panoramic view of buildings similar in size. She was so high up that the ground was barely visible, but no traces of fear showed. She moved closer to the ledge and looked over, not seeming to care about the distance between her and the streets below. Martha sat on the edge of the building. The cars that rolled on the streets beneath her looked like colorful goths. She held the rose in the air, examining it against the backdrop of the blue sky and sunlight, then lowered it and began plucking the petals. Each petal blew in the wind as she plucked it. One by one, she watched each one drift down into the city below. The height was so great that the flurry of orange petals became invisible as they fell further. Without any warning, Martha jumped from the building. The surroundings blurred as she descended. The ground pulled closer but slower than normal. Martha picked up speed. Jacob raised his hand to his mouth as the ground approached. His eyes squinted and the screen went black before Martha hit the ground. Jacob flinched with Martha's sudden shift in the chair. Her hands moved from her side and up to her head, removing the helmet. Jacob saw a bright light inside the helmet as she took it off, but it was gone by the time her seat returned upright. Well done, Melbourne said with a nod. While Martha and the professor spoke, Jacob whispered to Dean and Zoe. So that was the whole brain emulation stuff. Yep. You just saw her go inside of her own thoughts on the screen. I mean... It takes a lot of control to really do anything in your thoughts, but still interesting, right? I can't wait to analyze it. Analyze? Once they're done talking over there, we'll go over the video to discuss the themes of the projection and stuff like that. Just as she finished, Melbourne turned from Martha and back to the computer where he typed furiously for a few minutes before backing away. The screen above the machine came to life again and Martha's projection started to replay from the beginning. All right then. Any thoughts or observations on the projection? Everyone remained silent for a moment while they watched the blue fade away from the video, revealing Martha in the grass as it had before. Well, there's visible emotional significance. Seeing that no one was talking, Zoe spoke up. I don't have any ideas for the start of the projection, but at the end, when Martha was picking the petals from the rose, 
It was similar to what you would see in displays of irritation. To me, it looked like she was doing a repetitive motion as a form of relaxation, possibly trying not to act out in anger or frustration. Remembering those two places maybe brought back some negative feelings. Jacob watched the recording with just as much interest as he had the first time it played. He watched Martha's graceful movements as she pulled the rose from the ground without hesitation or struggle. Excellent observation, Zoe. Does anyone else have any thoughts? I actually agree with Zoe. You could even say that pulling the rose from the ground was a symbol of frustration. The fact that those two locations came to her mind must link them together. Dean added. Hmm. Jacob began to wonder what he could do if he got the chance to use the machine. As we conclude this episode, the mysteries surrounding the airplane crash of Flight 757 and Jacob's interest in all that he's seen leave us with more questions than answers. What caused the tragic events aboard Flight 757? And what secrets lie hidden beneath the surface? What of Jacob? Now that he's had a glimpse of the fascinating project he's involved in, what lies ahead of him? Join us next time as we dive deeper into actuality, where the line between reality and the subconscious blurs. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the action.